Thanks very much, Stephanie. I really appreciate the invitation. As always, I love speaking with master gardeners um, because all of you are out there, you know, working on your plants and talking to people, and that's great. It's such a beautiful day that I'm really grateful that anyone is joining the webinar. <laughs> I know it would be really great to be outside. So I'll try to make this worth your while. Uh, and then maybe um, we can all go back out into our gardens uh, when, <laughs> when the afternoon uh, is a little bit farther along. So today I wanna talk about um, how climate, climate change affects native plants. And um, I'll give you a bunch of examples that I think um, you can um, you can make use of in your thinking. Um, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to show this. I show that all the time. I just want to recap the um, usual information about how climate change works and what has happened. Um, I know that many of you have attended a lot of my webinars before and have heard this. Um, in which case, you can just sing along. Um, or here's another thing, um, you can um, listen along and make sure that you have got all your information straight so that you can tell other people. Uh, so you all are deputized to talk to um, everyone you know about climate change and how it affects them and their plants and just sort of daily life. So um, the last five years have been the hottest since 1884. Uh, and in fact, I just read that this past summer was the hottest summer um, uh, during that whole period. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, things are definitely warming up. So this is a, just a graph of the um, global average temperature. These are the red dots. And then the, um, there's error bars um, indicating uh, spatial variation. And um, this is in the 1800s, of course, sort of around the time the Industrial Revolution starts and things are uh, starting to go along, go along. And then you see that we are experiencing, particularly after about 1970, um, uh, almost, you know, monotonic increase in temperature. It goes up and down, but the trend is very, very clear. And um, here are the last five years um, and 2020 is gonna be in here. I suspect 2020 will be very close to the top actually. So uh, there, we're not going back to this. We'll never go back there. Um, we'll be very lucky if we're able to stabilize uh, temperatures you know, up here somewhere uh, that will require a lot of work and we don't want them to go much higher. This um, red dotted line indicates temperatures that are already one degree centigrade above pre-industrial level. That means uh, before the industrial revolution and people started burning coal, et cetera. And um, you can see we're already above that, you know, uh, and that means it's really time to start taking more serious action so that we don't wind up, you know, uh, off the chart here somewhere with a really, really high temperature. So um, this, this statistic blows me away all the time. 19 of the 20 hottest years have been since the year 2000, um, which basically is shown here. Uh, the last of the 20 years in the last 20 years is 1998. That's the one that doesn't fit in here, 19. But um, as soon as we get um, the data for 2020, it will be the 20 of the 20 hottest years will um, be since 19, since 2000. Now, why is this happening? I know, again, all of you have heard this before, or many of you have, but just in case there's still somebody out there who isn't quite clear on how climate change works, the idea is that there are many gases in the atmosphere, of course, oxygen, nitrogen, et cetera. But there are some gases in the atmosphere that interfere with the loss of heat from space. And so the um, issue is every day the sun is shining down, warming the earth up. And the, um, in order for the earth to stay the same temperature, an equal amount of heat has to be lost. Uh, and um, as you all know, uh, like think about a dark parking lot, black as asphalt parking lot in the summer, or even the beach, you can see these uh, sort of shimmery waves. Um, that's a, um, a sort of visualization of infrared waves, uh, heat waves leaving the earth. And so the sun warms the earth up, heat is radiated back into space. And when that stays in balance, everything stays the same temperature. However, um, this is a cartoon of the atmosphere here. Um, 
there are these special gases in the atmosphere that slow heat loss down, okay? And these are the so-called greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, those are the main ones. Um, there are some others. Um, and the issue is that as the infrared waves are making their way out into space, um, if they if an infrared wave collides with one of these greenhouse gas molecules, it's briefly absorbed and then it gets bounced off in some random direction. So sometimes like this, it'll bounce back to earth. Maybe it'll bounce sort of in a direction towards earth and then uh, uh, hit another one and bounce out. But the idea is that the more gas molecules, the more greenhouse gas molecules, there are stuffed into this little thin atmosphere, which is only about five to seven miles thick, okay? That might seem big, but on the scale of the whole earth, it's like tissue paper. Um, the more greenhouse gas molecules are stuffed into this space, the slower the heat loss because there's more bouncing around of the infrared waves before they can uh, get through the atmosphere, which means that um, uh, as heat loss slows down, slows down, slows down, but the same amount of heat gain is coming all the time from the sun, then the atmosphere warms up, okay? That's like it. And that's just a function of the sort of physical chemical properties of these molecules and their interactions with the gases. So it's like the laws of, uh, the laws of chemistry and physics, and it's pretty hard to argue with that. Um, and if you've been paying attention to climate uh, uh, arguments about climate change, you will notice that you never hear anyone say that the greenhouse effect, that's this, does not work <laughs> because it's, you know, the laws of chemistry and physics, it's going to work. Um, okay, so people ask me all the time how we know this is not just a natural cycle of um, increased temperature or increased carbon dioxide. And um, again, I know a lot of you have seen this and you can just chant along here. Um, this is a somewhat complicated graph. It starts out here at the present, okay, and it goes backwards 800,000 years, um, which is about eight times as long as humans have been on the planet, so a really long time. And um, uh, what we can see is there's really two graphs here, one for carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and one for temperature. And you can see that carbon dioxide concentration over all this period of time, 800,000 years, has gone up and down and up and down and up and down. On, on a sort of more or less regular basis. And temperature, again, more or less follows the carbon dioxide for the reason I just explained. When there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the heat loss is slower, so the earth warms up, okay? And, um, and we've seen this over all this period of time. Now, we know what causes these cycles, okay? It had nothing to do with climate change. Uh, but it does generate the ice ages because when we have uh, low carbon dioxide and low temperature, that's when we get an ice age and high carbon dioxide, high temperature, then we're in between. So um, this process, which produces the ice ages, produces these oscillations, but you'll notice that over this whole time, um, there's pretty much no time when it goes over the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere goes over 300 parts per million. That's just a concentration. Um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 2020 is 413 parts per million, and it's basically going up all the time. And this is a whole lot higher than this, this sort of uh, highest level that is generated by this process. So we know that this is not part of a natural cycle. It's certainly not part of this natural cycle because this natural cycle can't produce a level of carbon dioxide this high, okay? And um, that's just kind of scientific inference, basic scientific inference. You can't get an outlier point like this out of a process that's never produced something like that. You, you basically have to add something to get the carbon dioxide up to here. And we know that that added element is in fact burning of fossil fuels that um, humans have been doing since the industrial revolution. So, um, Okay, uh, scientists have, uh, have announced in the last few years that they now um, understand that all of the warming in the past 50 years has been to hum due to human activities, that is burning fossil fuels. So how do we know humans are responsible? 
um, uh, there are a lot of people out there who uh, accept that the climate is changing, but they think that it's due to natural causes. Um, uh, we know that humans are responsible, first of all, because we know that when you burn fossil fuels, carbon, um, fossil fuels are fossilized carbon from previously living things, either from previously living plants, that's what coal is, or previously living protozoa and other stuff is what, what natural gas is. Um, and when we burn that, we bring it out of the earth and burn it, then that releases carbon dioxide that has not been in the system for you know, millions, even a billion years. And that's essentially new carbon dioxide. So um, somebody figured out how to understand or how to determine how much carbon has been, carbon has been released by burning fossil fuels all the way back to the industrial revolution. So we started out by burning coal and then we started burning, we humans, okay, not us, because we weren't there in, 19, in 1850. Then humans started to burn um, oil, then natural gas, okay? And um, we know how much carbon has been produced by burning these fossil fuels. And if we look at the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is this black line, it pretty much matches the rate of um, addition of carbon from burning fossil fuels. So this is literally like the smoking gun. Um, if you don't accept that burning fossil fuels by humans has increased the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then you have to come up with some other explanation that's better than this. And this matches pretty perfectly. So um, it, it is a record of what we've been doing. Okay, where's global warming going? It's not staying in the atmosphere. It'd be really, really hot if all that heat, with extra heat stayed there. It's been, a, most of it has been absorbed by the oceans. And it turns out that this, all the extra heat in the ocean is really one of the main drivers of all of the changes that we're seeing. So um, warmer oceans mean there's more evaporation of seawater from the ocean, which means more water vapor is going into the air. And the warmer air means that more water vapor is held in the air. So it's more humid, okay? There's more water vapor in the air. Like I think between five and 7% more now than in the 1950s. Um, and together, uh, warmer oceans and warmer air produce global changes in winds, which is super important. You know, we all talk about the polar vortex in the winter. That's, uh, that's a change that has been caused by climate change and ocean currents are changing. And so there's a lot of changes that happen from uh, slowing heat loss from earth. And it's not just that the air temperature is increasing. So um, together, these are the changes that are occurring are called by scientists, the new normal. And the new normal basically involves, uh, uh, is produced by those interactions between the warming ocean and warming air. And we're getting rising temperatures, which means warmer winters and earlier springs, longer growing season, more extremely hot days and fewer cool nights. So these impact plants, of course. We're getting heavier downpours, a lot more rain is falling as, as downpours, and we're getting more flooding, both inland flooding and coastal flooding. And we have more summer drought and more wildfires. Uh, and these affect native plants, all of these. So heat, flooding, droughts, and extreme weather do a number of things that affect plants of all kinds, you know, garden plants too, but th that's not what this talk is about. So these um, changes um, uh, in temperature and, uh, and precipitation increase plant stress um, increase the susceptibility of plants to disease and herbivory by insects um, and, and other herbivores. Um, they, uh, these uh, changes in temperature and precipitation can change species interactions. Now, what does that mean? It means they can alter how species, plant species, compete with one another, or they can change how much herbivory there is on, um, on plant species, or how, um, how well pollination occurs. They can even mediate changes in the soil microbial effects. And so um, pretty much most of, of biodiversity is really tied up in these very cool species interactions. And when you muck those up, then you can have a big problem with 
uh, community structure sort of falling apart or ecosystems being seriously damaged. So I'll give you examples of all of this as I go along. This is just a sort of outline of what we're gonna talk about. Um, these elements can change the availability of habitat, the suitability of the, of the habitat that a plant might find itself in. They can alter the species range, um, even causing local extinction of some species. So a, species, a native species might go extinct in uh, say Georgia, but still be found farther north, okay? And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And these things can also change community composition, that is which species are in the community and in the plant community and how they interact with one another. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of subtlety in the way that increasing um, temperatures and changes in precipitation affect plants. Um, so uh, we'll start talking about temperature um, and first about the um, changes in the winter. Um, uh, across the nation, warming has led to a longer frost-free season. This is a little bit old now. This is, ends in 2011, so there's only more frost-free days now than there were, you know, in 2011. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how it varies across the country. In the Northeast, we have 10 or maybe 12 more now uh, than we had um, uh, between 1901 and 1960. But look at the West. 21 more days, 18 more days. This is one reason the, there's a longer frost-free season, higher temperatures. This is one reason that they're having serious droughts and fires out here. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, longer frost-free season means there's fewer cold nights for perennials, especially like fruit trees and stuff. They aren't native plants, but well, no, they aren't. Um, except pawpaw um, that need chilling. Um, but mostly important for this talk is that warmer winters can lead to a big set of domino effects on interactions between species. And I'll give you an example of that in, in just a minute, um, or right now, <laughs> um, if I remember my slides. So I, I will be giving you a lot of examples from the work of a professor um, named David Inouye, who is retired now, but he used to be in the biology department at University of Maryland, back when I was also in the biology department. And um, he has done a body of work that is so unique that it is really worth talking about. Um, it is not exactly about Maryland, but what I want you to take from this is um, a, a set of examples of the way that things can change. They can change like that anywhere, but we have very limited data um, on interactions between native plants and um, and uh, the environment and other species. Um, and David Inouye uh, worked in the Rockies and followed you know, populations of native plants out there for 35 or 40 years every year. And he has the most detailed data set ever. So I really wanted to make use of this to give you some um, good examples of the kinds of things that can happen um, when climate change, um, as climate change is occurring. So this is an example of um, the, one of the sort of um, um, kinds of interactions that you might not have predicted right off the top of your head. Um, when it's warmer in the Rockies over the winter, there's less snow. Okay, well, that's really obvious. Um, and this is a species, um, I think this species is, is called a Ridgeron. I have a picture of it in the next slide. Um, but this is a plant species that lives out there, a native plant. And um, when the winters are warmer, that blooms a little bit earlier. Um, but there are always still late freezes. And so when you get earlier blooming, then a late freeze, the flowers are very vulnerable to dying from the freeze, especially if there's not very much snow. And so what David showed was, um, here's the maximum number of flowers, and these are living flowers, not dead flowers. This is a dead flower that was frozen. And um, snowpack on the 30th of April. So this is basically how much snow is there in the spring in this place where these these plants occur. And so he just basically, instead of using a data point, put every year on here, which is kind of cool. And um, uh, what you can see is that the years where there was a lot of snow in, in the end of April, 
there were a lot of flowers, okay, because the snow um, protects the flowers from freezing. But when there is very little snow, this is centimeters, when there's very little snow late in the season, then there are not very many flowers because the, the flowers are, are exposed to the freezing temperatures and then they just basically die. So when there's not very much snow because the, warm is, the winter is warmer, there are less flowers. So there's less food for the pollinators, which is bad for the pollinators. Um, um, and fewer seeds. So even among the flowers that did make it, the, um, the, um, the pollinators are, are, are pollinating those, but there's fewer seeds to maintain that plant population. So this is an interaction between winter temperature and the success of flowers uh, um, uh, and seed set in um, perennial native plants. So the other thing that, um, that David showed was that um, plants and pollinators can respond differently to the warming. So um, many, many plants are flowering earlier as temperatures warm up, and I'll show you that in the next slide. But the pollinators are uh, operating under different cues. And so they're not tied to uh, the uh, flowering date of the plants. They over many millions of years, they have evolved to be matched on the flowering date. That is the pollinators show up to pollinate when the flowers are there, okay? So there's a match. But if the plant responds independently to climate change and moves the flowering time, the pollinators may show up and there may not be any, any flowers then because it flowered earlier or the pollinators can show up earlier than the plants flower, okay? So we, get an, we can get an asynchrony uh, between the plants and the pollinators and this can cause again, a failure to set seed um, or when the pollinators show up and there's not enough flowers then the pollinators, um, the pollinator populations are in trouble because there's not enough food. And so um, this is that plant erigeron that I showed you the flower, the dead flowers of in the previous slide. And this is the pollinator that um, David worked on. And then we've got hummingbird pollinator plants. And this is a hawk moth. These are beautiful moths and a delphinium. And I'll talk, talk to you in just a minute about um, some other issues with delphinium. But, um, you know, we're so used to the plants and pollinators being around at the right time that we don't remember that this, this is the result of many, many millions of years of interactions between these two species that have tuned that timing so that it matches. Um, okay, so, oh wait, this way. All right, so this is some more of David's work and you're not meant to be able to read this, but he studied 69 native uh, plant species in the Rockies for 39 years, okay? And so this graph is a little complicated and you don't really need to get anything except the general picture. This is the, this shows the phenological shift. That means the uh, shift in the phenology or the timing of key life history events, in this case, flowering, the shift in flowering time and negative means earlier and positive means later. And so this is the baseline original flowering time um, at the beginning of the 39 year study. And each one of these lines uh, corresponds to a native plant. And there's uh, three symbols for each line, first flowering, peak flowering, latest flowering. You don't need to worry about all that. Just look at where these points are, okay? If you look down here, almost all of the points are earlier, okay? That's pretty much all I want you to see from this. 69 native species, most of them are flowering earlier. A couple of them are flowering later, okay? But in general, the native species have shifted earlier. Um, and this can have an important consequence to the life history and success of the plants because when plants flower earlier, they often are smaller, okay? And that means that they may have fewer seeds or the seeds may be smaller. Um, and the seed, you know, the, and either having fewer seeds or smaller seeds can affect the success of the plant population. This um, graph to me, um, and all of David's work actually, illustrates that long-term studies are absolutely essential. Because if you just went out to the Rocky Mountains for, you know, five years, um, 
and tried to plot something like this, you'd never see anything because there's way too much variation and things happen. Although biologically speaking, things are happening at a rocket pace um, from our timetable, five years is nothing, right? And um, we, we would, he would not have seen this level of results if he just looked for five years. So these long-term studies are crucial and um, uh, uh, not everybody has the awesome place that David had to go study these flowers every summer for 39 years. He went to the Crested Butte Biological Station in Crested Butte, um, uh, Colorado and um, went there every year for 39 years and, and had a bunch of undergraduates going out to the meadows and the fields and watching these flowers every year, which I thought seemed like a really great you know, thing to do. But very little funding is available for these kinds of long-term studies because people don't understand how important they are. So um, they're really crucial and this is why. Um, another, I think this is the last example from David. Um, if any of you have been out to those Rocky Mountain Meadows when these plants are blooming, it really is spectacular. This is Delphinium, Delphinium barbari. It's pollinated by the broad-tailed hummingbird and also by hawk moths. Um, and um, this is an example where uh, this plant flowers earlier, but there's still the, always the possibility of a late frost. And when you get a late frost like this settles down on these blooms, then the blooms all die. So um, I have here unexpected cold snap. Actually, we don't know exactly what day a cold snap is gonna happen, but when plants are flowering a month earlier, we know there's still gonna be a hard frost sometime, okay? And so um, uh, if that cold snap happens at a vulnerable time like this, it'll kill all the flowers. Then when the hummingbirds show up, no flowers. When the hawk moths show up, no flowers, right? So it's bad for the plant population because there's no seeds. Uh, but there's no food for the pollinators. So it's really bad for them too. And um, if this kind of uh, event happens year after year after year, then this plant pollinator interaction is gonna break down. So even though, here's the bottom line for these slides, even though these slides are about the Rocky Mountains, um, this kind of breakdown in species interactions can happen anywhere, okay? It's just that we have this documentation for this population. So this is highly relevant to everything that's going on in Maryland. Um, oh, I do wanna just say also, I'll be sending um, a handout of the slides to Stephanie and she'll send you that when she sends the link to the recording. So those of you who are big note takers, um, you can relax a little bit because whatever is on these slides, you're going to receive um, in, in a few days. So um, you can use that to, um, to sort of uh, complement your note taking. Okay, now I wanna move on from the Rockies and come to the East Coast now and uh, look at another kind of a long-term study that actually involved different people. And um, this is a study of flowering time that was um, done in um, uh, Thoreau's wood around Walden Pond. Okay, we're all, we're all <laughs> familiar with Walden Pond. And the, this is, a, of course, a nice, nice statue to Henry David Thoreau, big naturalist. And um, uh, it's very interesting that when Thoreau was alive, he monitored the flowering time of um, a group of species. Um, these are data that were excavated by um, 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 this person, Dr. Richard Premack, who's a professor at um, Boston University. And he went back in the archives and got these data. And so he showed uh, in, in 1850, their sort of average flowering time of a group of species was the 15th of May. It turns out in 1900, another botanist, last name of Hosni, I forgot the first name, um, looked at a few more species. I'm not sure how much, uh, whether these species are also represented in here, okay? But we're looking at the averages. And he found that the average flowering time in 1900 was about the 10th of May or maybe the 11th of May, okay? And then, you know, uh, in 2000, I think six or something, um, Richard Premack went out there and studied the flowering time of another group of species. And you can see that if you 
sort of look at this whole set of data, of course, there's nothing in between here, then if you just fit a line to these three points of the averages, you'd see a decrease in flowering time, earlier flowering time. Some of these plants that Richard studied, it, you know, really changed their flowering time dramatically to way, way earlier. So um, this is kind of a cool um, example, again, of looking at historical data with present day data to capture changes that are subtle year to year, but very visible if you look over, in this case, 150 years. Um, now, oh yeah, Richard Premack, Premack also found that invasives flower earlier than natives. And this is kind of interesting because the invasive plants have uh, sort of responded to changes in, in, uh, in the climate more to, to a greater extent than the native plants. And so um, they're flowering even earlier than the natives. And you know that can have consequences because they're also breaking their dormancy earlier than the natives. Um, and as a matter of fact, here we are. <laughs> Warmer winters favor invasives because they're surviving better than they were when the winters weren't as warm. Okay, like this stuff, which is around all the time now. Um, and they flower earlier, even earlier than the natives, which gives them a competitive advantage over the natives because they come out of their, well, they never really go dormant. They, they are out there um, ready when the temperature warms up in the spring, they start growing, they start flowering and they take up space and they use nutrients um, and water. And uh, that gives them a competitive advantage over the natives, which might not um, even start to push their leaves out for you know three weeks after these guys, and not just this species, but invasive species in general. Um, uh, the natives might come out much later than these invasives who have already commandeered a bunch of resources. So this is, um, you know, another sort of thing uh, uh, that gives inv invasive plants a benefit. Um, this is a picture that came from the U.S. Forest Service um, and um, it, part of their project of tracking invasive, the presence of invasive plants in U.S. forests. And the way that you look at this is they divided each state up into, this looks like counties, and then they have, they divided the counties up into subplots. And then they just counted in a subplot or they just noted, is, are there invasive plants in the subplot? Okay, I forget how big the subplots are. But the key is either no data, so they don't know anything about what's going on here. But, um, but the key is how many of the subplots have been invaded by invasive plants. So in other words, if they see one invasive plant or 100, they still score it. That subplot has an invasive plant in it. So um, the red colors like you see along here um, and along here, um, are between 56 and 100%, basically, the dark, dark red, you know, here 100% of the subplots have invasive plants in them. Um, and then the lower, the greener colors um, are lower percentages. So less invasive plants um, along the coast, more it looks like in the sort of mountain areas. Um, but there's no question, and you know, you don't have to go very far, even in your yard or the nearest place, uh, the nearest bit of a sort of abandoned forest, um, to see invasive plants all over the place, um, and they're doing very, very well in climate change. Um, this is an example of just one of these. Oriental bittersweet is a vine uh, that really takes over. This is not kudzu. This is Oriental bitter bittersweet but it does that same thing. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna grow over everything. And this is a um, map. These are two maps from the Climate um, Change Atlas from the Forest Service, which I'll talk about more in a, in a minute. Okay, here's the, um, here's the um, URL for that. Um, and again, you're gonna be getting this handout so you can copy the URL off of here. But this is the distribution of this now. These little dots means we, we um, there's a high probability of seeing um, oriental bittersweet in these locations. And you sort of see, um, uh, this looks like, uh, I don't know what state, in Massachusetts, okay. Um, I don't, it's a little unclear if that's the actual state boundary, but 
there's Cape Cod, so this is Massachusetts northward. Now, the climate atlas projects into the future if we continue along the same path of carbon emissions that we're on now, that is we just keep doing what we're doing, we don't make any, do any climate action. That's called business as usual. Under business as usual, it's gonna get a lot hotter and we're going to see an expansion of many of these um, invasives, a range expansion of many of these invasives where um, the, dark, the brown colors um, which are dark brown dots over here um, are, you can see that this thing now has very high probability of occurring all the way up here and, and into Maine where it doesn't really occur now, okay? And so that's like, okay, there goes this invasive and it's just gonna really take over uh, scrubby forests, second growth forests, you know, all along in this area. Um, okay, so uh, let's, this is a stopping point. If there's any, um, any burning questions, I could address those now. Um, yeah. Jane, anything? Actually, yeah, this is um, this is a good point to stop because it's 1238. So we can do the questions that we have so far and then we'll take a five minute break. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we have a couple that have come in for the first half of the presentation. The first one is what species are most vulnerable to extinction pollination degradation? Um, I don't think there is a list of species that are most vulnerable. And I don't even have in my own mind a list of the characteristics of species that would make them the most vulnerable. But I guess if you think about what we've talked about um, so far, like flowering time, um, native plants that don't adjust their flowering time earlier um, may be more vulnerable to extinction because um, uh, uh, they're not making use of the longer growing season. Um, then again, they might not get into a mismatch with their pollinators or their pollinators, they are on their own, you know, they're responding to climate change on their own. So it's hard to predict what's going to cause a mismatch. I don't think really very much research at all has been done on trying to determine the characteristics that make um, a plant vulnerable other than rarity. Rare plants are always more vulnerable to any kind of a change. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a little list on that. Sure, um, makes sense. Um, and a related question, are certain native genera better able to adapt to this shift in flowering time? I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, uh, I'm sure it's probably yet to be seen yeah. too, you know, a lot of research. I'm is, sorry? A lot of research I think is, I'm sure coming on this, it seems a little early to have this figured out. Yeah, well, there are, um, you know, there are a number of websites on um, adaptations in native plants and um, a, a lot of people are worried about um, it becoming too hot or something in a mm -hmm. particular location and then uh, uh, favoring the ability to migrate. It's hard for plants to migrate, right? An individual plant, plant can't migrate. Pollen can move, seeds can move, but the rate of movement demanded to keep up with the climate change. Just think of the way the um, uh, uh, hardiness zones are moving northward, okay? So uh, for a plant to remain successful, it, it has to sort of be able to stay in its uh, zone, right? And if it moves, you know, if the hardiness zones are moving northward, then the plants, um, the ranges of the plants need to be adjusted also. And so a lot of people are arguing about whether, well, should we do assisted migration? That is, you know, dig up plants and move them northwards. It's always risky to mess with nature because it's a lot more complicated than anybody thinks. And you start moving plants around and you can get into a lot of trouble because <laughs> communities Absolutely. and ecosystems are really complicated. So, um, uh, so Other still questions? lots to learn in that area. Yep. All right. So the next question is the increase in number of frost-free days is compared to 1901 to 1960. How does the mini ice age of the early 1900s affect that? The mini ice age? The mini ice age of the early 1900s. I'm not familiar with the mini ice age of the early 1900s. Um, we can go back if there's time after. Um, we can go back and look at that initial graph I had of the temperatures. Um, 
I don't remember any big dips in temperature. Um, there is a little bump in temperatures in the 40s, but that's due to something different. So we can revisit that, but I'm not, I will just say right now, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. All right, last one for now. Why don't invasive plants suffer the same decline as early blooming natives? Um, a lot of times invasive plants are invasive. I mean, this is the question you have to ask yourself first. What makes a plant invasive? A plant that's invasive is usually pretty generalized. It can get along in a lot of different environments. It doesn't have very specific needs. Um, uh, often um, doesn't have a lot of invasive plants if they're introduced, don't have their normal suite of, of, um, of herbivores that eat them. Um, or diseases, they've escaped those because they've moved from some other location. Um, but you know, what makes a plant weedy? Well, it's able to really survive a lot of different places and, um, and it gets around, you know, the seeds are, uh, the seeds are transported, the pollen moves around and so it can move into a new area very rapidly. Um, there's a whole suite of characteristics that make plants um, invasive or weedy. I'm not sure if those two things are the same or different. So this is not my specialty. So I'm a, a little bit, um, I'm bumping up against the, the edge of my knowledge a little bit here, but um, I think that's a very interesting, interesting question. And it sort of goes, um, it complements the one that was asked earlier of, of um, are there certain genera or certain kinds of native plants that are more vulnerable? Um, are there things that make those invasive? So, it, so adaptable. And I think the, ability to change flowering time easily, okay? Very, they're very responsive to the temperature cues. That probably is very adaptive for them and native plant, many native plants don't have that. So um, anybody who wants to get up, are we having like a couple minute break? Get yeah. up, get a drink of water, stretch. Yep, so um, it's 12.45 almost. So we're gonna take a five minute break. We'll return at 12.50 to continue the presentation. All right, so welcome back everyone. Um, we did have a couple questions come into the chat over the break. So at this point, Sarah has answered some of them in the chat box. So feel free to check into those there. Um, if not, we'll get to the remaining questions uh, at the end of the presentation. And again, just a reminder for everyone keeping time, we're going until 1.30 this afternoon. All right, we can go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um yeah, somebody asked, will the chat be available? Uh, you you save the I chat, right? That. So you can send out a, that text file? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, we're carrying on. We talked about the effects of warmer winters on plants. Now let's consider animals because they interact with plants in important ways. Um, the deer are really loving these warmer winters. Um, there's a lot more food around for the deer to eat during the winter, which means their populations are healthier. They are surviving better over the winter. They're having more offspring and the offspring are surviving better. So it's just like deer heaven out there right now. And um, that has a big impact on plant populations. Deer grazing changes plant communities because the native plants that deer like, like trillium, okay, here's a picture of trillium, um, while well, the deer eat them. And so the, the uh, population sizes of those plants decline they're stressed out by this herbivory where um, the plants that deer don't like increase like garlic mustard and multiflora rose. Now it'd be really great if the deer would just get with it and eat these things instead of the trillium, but you know, it never seems to work that way, right? <laughs> so these undesirable plants are now everywhere and it, um, it's pretty hard to find trillium around in, um, in forests anymore. Um, you can still see them, but they're not nearly as common as they used to be. So this is a big thing. Um, the, these deer change the plant communities by eliminating some species by herbivory. Um, insects, of course, are also animals. Um, uh, although this came, surprisingly, I learned when I was teaching introductory biology that not all people realize that insects are animals. Um, this came as a surprise to some of my students. Um, anyway, insects are animals. They are also having better overwinter survival. They are coming out of dormancy earlier in the spring. 
Um, and that means, you know, they have a longer frost free season too. And um, some insects can add an extra generation um, if there is enough, you know, time at the, um, at the end of the season. Um, so um, uh, a lot of caterpillars do this. Um, corn earworm does this, for, for example, that's what this is. Um, uh, the first generation comes out earlier. They, you know, the caterpillars do eat their eat themselves into uh, oblivion and form their pupae, and then the adults come out. And it might still be, you know, early August or something, even in July. And so, in many places, their um, uh, insects that can do this are adding another generation, which just means more insects. Um, but the thing I want to really discuss in detail for native plants is the issue of range expansion um, of, of insects and how that affects native plants. Um, there's two really terrible examples. Um, the first one I'm going to tell you about is on the East Coast. Um, and it's been um, assisted by warmer winters. Um, the hemlock woolly adulgid was introduced in 1951 um, in Northern Virginia somewhere. And um, you can see, I cut off part of this picture, but um, this, these are yearly sort of um, diagrams of the ranges, you know, the color around where they're found. And you can see basically that the ranges are expanding. Um, uh, uh, up into northern areas, uh, and this is part of the north northward movement is uh, being facilitated by by um, climate change. The other thing is that the plants are not doing so as you know great. Uh, there are some uh, stressors on the plants, especially mountain plants like this, that don't like um, warm weather. Um, and so um, before the hemlock woolly adelgid, these hemlock forests looked like this. They were just beautiful and thick and tons of plants. And this picture was taken in 2009 and you can see the dead hemlock trees. And these are dead because of the attacks or infestation of these little teeny critters, okay? So here's a hemlock branch and they call this, um, these little guys are like aphids. They're similar to aphids, but they're not exactly aphids, but they, they have sucking mouth parts. They pierce the plant and they suck the phloem out like aphids do. And they call them woolly because they cover themselves with this white waxy stuff, which looks you know, to some people like wool, okay? It of course is not wool, it's wax. And they hide in there, okay? So that's sort of a protective coating. And you can tell that a hemlock has them because they're all gathered on these uh, ribs and covered up with their little woolly, their little woolly waxy stuff. <coughs> <laughs> which protects them from predators. And these things are tiny, but there are a lot of them. And they glom onto these trees and then just basically suck the phloem out of them until they die. And um, this picture shows not, not only the expanding range of these um, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, but the range of the hemlocks, that's in gray, okay? So they're a, a cool weather plant only found in the mountains down here, up into Maine, Northern Michigan, Northern Wisconsin. And I think you can be pretty sure that the hemlock woolly adelgid is basically gonna fill up this territory. And um, it's gonna be bad news for the hemlocks. So, um, if you haven't seen hemlocks recently, you should make an effort to go see some <laughs> because they're not doing very well in Maryland. Um, the other really tragic um, story of native plants and insect range expansions, of course, is the mountain pine beetle out in the West. Um, this is a, a old map, well, from 2008, of um, where mountain pine beetle used to be. They used to be restricted to more Southern, this is the West, right, California, um, uh, I think that's Colorado, I don't know, Western states, here we are. And um, they were confined down here because it was too cold for them to move northward. But as it warmed up, they were able to move north, um, maybe in part because they came along a coastal range like this, but on other um, conifers. But then they were able to move north and infest conifers, Douglas fir and other things up here in, um, in um, British Columbia, Canada. So these guys, again, small but mighty. Here's a pencil, right? Here's the size of one of the adults. 
they um, they uh, bore into under the bark and they they lay their eggs and the larvae also tiny just bore around and um, eat the very sensitive um, um, plant tissue under the bark which kills the trees and um, they make these little galleries and hang around in there and um, they it's sort of insidious because the females um, send out a pheromone when they find a good tree. They like trees that are a little bit stressed. So in Colorado, they had a, a long period of drought, which stressed a lot of their trees. Um, and, and that really made them susceptible to the pine beetle. All of these red trees are dead from pine beetle. Okay. And um, uh, the female finds a good tree and then she sends out a pheromone, a, a chemical that is um, dispersed on the air which basically says, come on over here, I've got a great tree. And so then all the pine beetles glom onto this good tree and you know that accelerates its, its demise. So it's not just one or two pine beetles, it's zillions of pine beetles because they call out to each other. So formerly restricted to south more southerly states, this isn't really southerly, but not Northern states, they moved up here and then it, became warmer up here and they were able to cross over the Canadian Rockies, okay? And that's what's shown here. Um, they were uh, eating lodgepole pine, here's some up the coast, Douglas fir, other things. Uh, and they crossed the Rockies because it was warm enough that they could, during the winter, that they could survive that. And then they shifted, the mountain pine beetles shifted onto another species of pine, jack pine, Lodgepole pine is not found all the way across Canada. Jack pine is found all the way across Canada. And so where are the mountain pine beetles? Boop, 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 boop. They're coming, coming eastward. And they're going to meet up with the southern pine beetles, which are expanding their range from down here up through Maryland. We've already had trouble with some southern pine beetles up here. And then they're going to they're going to be both mountain pine beetles and southern pine beetles up here. So this is not good. Okay. Uh, it takes a long time to grow these big forests, but not very long to destroy them. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, the mountain pine beetles also contributed to a sort of three-pronged disaster. Um, well, they didn't contribute to the drought, but they were part of this big disaster in, in Colorado uh, between 2012 and 2013. There was a gigantic drought in the Midwest and, um, and Colorado um, in 2012. And a lot of trees were stressed and then killed by mountain pine beetle. So we had a lot of those dead trees that I showed you in the earlier um, slide were killed by mountain pine beetle. And it's very dry because there's a drought. So there was a lot of fire in Colorado in 2013. Okay, now those fires were, look like peanuts compared to what we're seeing in California now, but still a very big deal. A lot of Calif Colorado was burned and then heavy rains came. Well, there were no more big trees because it was all the landscape was burned, no understory. And so rain came down on the mountains and went zipping downhill and um, in September of 2013 and flooded Boulder, Colorado seriously. And there was bridges out and muds all, mud all over the place. It was a big disaster. This is what I call the drought fire flood syndrome aggravated by insect herbivory in this case. Um, so it's all these unusual stressors kind of coming together to make a bad situation. I'm gonna talk more about fire in, um, in a few minutes. Regular old heat stress from rising summer temperatures is also very hard on plants. Um, heat reduces growth rate because when um, plants are photosynthesizing, they have little openings on the underside of the leaves called stomates and these things open up and allow carbon dioxide to come in, which is used in photosynthesis and oxygen to go out, but when they're open, water vapor also goes out. Now that's the source of, cool, the, one of the sources of cooling effects of trees is the water vapor that's coming out, the transpiration. But when it's very hot, the plants close those things up because the plants lose too much water. And so they're not photosynthesizing as much, so they don't grow as fast, okay? Um, and, and they do that to um, 
decrease the water loss, which would be higher if they didn't do it. Okay, so um, every single stage of plants is is negatively impacted by heat. <coughs> Heat is really hard on forest trees. It, you know, they you know, don't grow as much for exactly the reason I just said. They're stressed out, which makes them, as I'll show you in a minute, more susceptible to pathogens, et cetera. And the large trees die first, okay? And that is a, a kind of demographic tragedy because large trees take a really long time to grow. Um, and when they die, they're very hard to replace. Okay, um, when trees get stressed, they are uh, fair game for insects and pathogens because stressed plants cannot produce the chemical, secondary chemical compounds that, that protect them from, in many cases, from herbivory or disease. So this is an example of, I think this is an oak, oak tree that was, you know, standing here in the middle of this grassy area looking really great until boom, it fell over. And um, when you look in the inside, <laughs> it was completely rotten because it had this armillaria root rot. Um, and uh, so even though it looked fine on the outside, it was in really bad shape inside from being more susceptible due to stress. Okay, let's talk about the California wildfires. This has been, this is a terrible situation, okay? And 2020 is not the first year of the wildfires, but you know, they've had drought out there almost every year. I think they've had a few non-drought years, but almost every year for like the last 10 or more years, years and years of drought, higher summer temperatures, longer growing season, which means longer fire season. So the fire season in the West has now ex uh, extended two months more than it was in, in the 1950s, two months more of fire season, which means a lot more potential for fire. This year has been particularly terrible. Four million acres have been burned. 31 people died. I mean, countless billions of dollars in damage because where do people like to build their houses? Next to trees, okay? Like they also like to build their houses next to coastlines. <laughs> Those are the two most dangerous places from climate change. Coastlines, you get hit by hurricanes and sea level rise, et cetera. And if you build your house near the forest, you're gonna get hit by you know, landslides or uh, wildfire. So this is something that's gonna come up a lot because insurers are not gonna to pay to rebuild, rebuild, rebuild um, homes that get destroyed repeatedly by fire or um, hurricanes. Now, what are the impacts of this kind of fire on plants? Um, this is a kind of geeky science picture. So uh, it, you don't need to look too carefully at the graphs if, the, if you, you don't like graphs, but I'll just tell you what they show. Um, this graph shows that between 1980 and 2015, um, this is the average water deficit, okay? So higher means more drought, okay? Lower means less drought. And in the earlier part of the period, you can see that more years were below the average. Um, and as we move to the later part of this period, more years are above the average, okay? And these gray dots indicate years when there were fires. And you can see that they um, are mostly found, you know, not always, but mostly found in years that um, have been very uh, warm and dry, okay? So it's pretty obvious, I think it makes total sense that if, if there's not enough water and the forest is dry, it's going to be more susceptible to fire. Um, but the point of the study, besides just showing that <coughs> there, you know, water deficits are increasing, it's becoming drier, is to show that for several species of, of this is a species, but this is a class of species, moist mixed conifers, that is um, conifer trees that grow in moist environments, grow in dry environments, lodgepole pine, or all, okay? And on this axis, we have yearly number of seedlings established every year. And on this one, we have cumulative establishment of seedlings, okay? So this line says, we start out with no seedlings after the fire, this is years after fire, no seedlings and every year some are added until you get up to the point where there's enough seedlings to replace the forest, okay? And this little dotted uh, line shows the year after fire, when 50% of the needed seedlings have already been recruited, okay? So what you can see is for a moist mixed conifers, it takes uh, like 13 or 14 years 
to replace the trees with seedlings, okay? Dry mixed conifers a little bit sooner, all combined still 11 years after the forest fire before the, the, um, the forest has recovered with enough seedlings. So forest fires have very long-term consequences. And if you repeatedly you know, have fires, um, uh, there, you, know, you don't have as many um, adult plants to produce the seeds for the seedling recruitment. So then that is you know, even worse. Okay. Um, one other cool thing, and again, this is a, a graph, I'm sorry to show this, I'll just tell you what it means. Wildfires can change the kinds of plants that come back after the fire. Um, so these folks, I'm sorry, I forgot to put on the citation here. This is the proportion of the flora, which are um, like north temperate kinds of, of, of plants, okay? And so um, uh, more cooler weather, wetter weather kind of thing. And these bars show, this was an experiment, um, how disturbed these different groups of plants were. And so here it was some plants that were not disturbed at all. They're all in the same general location. These guys got extra fuel. That means you know more brushy stuff underneath. These guys had wildfire, and um, and these guys uh, fuel plus wildfire, and these guys had wildfire. This I think is I forget exactly the details of this treatment, but the wildfire is the most extremely damaging treatment. So um, what we see is this is the point of this is that um, as the disturbance becomes greater, <coughs> the proportion of uh, plants that are sort of northern temperate plants, cool weather, wet weather, mesic kinds of plants, decreases. So this is what the forest starts out like, is basically more cool weather plants. But it shifts over to a different plant community, to more plants that are characteristic of more southern areas and xeric, which is dry. So the forest goes from being a nice wet, you know, cool weather forest to being uh, replaced by plants that do better in hot, dry environments, okay? Because there's, you know, the forest, the environment has totally changed. It's hotter and drier because there aren't as many big trees there. So burn plots are more likely to change from the northern temperate plant community to a southern, more dry plant community. And, you know, that's a big change. That is a huge change. And it really has a big impact on the ecosystem. Okay, rainfall, let's talk, talk about that real quick. Um, we talked about too little rainfall. There's also too much rainfall. Um, uh, and the changes in pre precipitation basically seemed like the swing between extremes, not just, you know, not just enough rainfall. There's always too little or too much. Um, much more rain is coming down fast as downpours, especially in our area. Um, and you know, here's a flooded, uh, flooded field. Flooding can stunt and kill plants depending on the timing of the flood relative to where the plant is, is in its growth cycle. Um, flooded areas have, tend to have more disease because they tend to stay wetter, okay? Um, flooding can bring in toxins from some other place. Um, and if you get a lot of flooding, <coughs> what's going to happen is the initial plants will be replaced with more flood tolerant plants. Okay. Um, and those plants were added, the flood tolerant plants were not there in the first place because they were out competed by the plants that were better suited to this environment. But if it becomes flooded very frequently, the original plants are no longer suited to that environment and they get replaced by different plants that are do better when they're frequently flooded. Okay, um, back in President Obama's um, <coughs> time, he started up the, t the Climate Resilience Toolkit, which is a whole set of tools for um, helping uh, our country become more resilient. And the Forest Service set up the Climate Change Atlas. I already showed you one picture of the Oriental Bittersweet. But the whole issue with the Climate Change Atlas <laughs> is to address the question, how will climate change affect the ranges of birds and plants? Um, and it's trees, birds and trees. So um, you can't read this very well, but they have the future distribution or ranges of 134 tree species and 147 bird species. And um, this is really fascinating site. You, you could get, dive in there and really not come out for a, a while. It's really interesting, but I wanted to just show you a couple of things from this site. 
um, one thing that's really riveting to me is the expected changes in the composition of um, forests. I'm, I just showed the east um, and south, but all across the country, the changes in the composition of forests under what they call business as usual. That is no change in our pattern of emission, which just means more and more and more and more emissions, more and more climate change. So now this is the way the forest um, basically uh, look across the east part of eastern part of the country and in the more northerly states we have <coughs> maple beech and birch okay um, in our part of the country we have oak and hickory forest that's a sort of uh, uh, um, climax forest type oak and hickory so pretty much maryland is all oak and hickory um, uh, the lighter green is oak and pine yeah, uh, orange is loblolly and shortleaf pine. So when you get down into the coastal part of Southern and coastal part of Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, down in the Southern states, it's all loblolly and shortleaf pine um, and longleaf pine down here. So this is, it, this is what the forests look like now. If we keep emitting the way we are and temperatures keep going up, it's gonna look really different. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're looking at Maryland, you might be going, oh, well, who cares? It's still gonna be oak and hickory. But look at the changes on the, you know, the sort of whole national level. Oak and hickory forests um, move northward, okay? Compare this to that. The uh, maple, beech, and birch uh, get essentially pushed up into northern areas because they can no longer survive down here. It's too warm and they get outcompeted by species that do better in the slightly warmer weather. Um, uh, the light green, the oak and pine, um, that it becomes more uh, predominant in the, it looks like in the Appalachians. Okay, a little bit of it here, but a lot of it down here. And then the, um, the yellow oak, um, oak gum and cypress, um, a little bit more of that, uh, but it, this shift in the oak um, hickory forest up here, um, up into Maine, and then the total loss of the spruce fir forest from Maine, whoa, that's really a big deal. And uh, maple syrup people, if you lose the maple beech and birch forest, then that's it for maple syrup. Um, and then out here in Michigan, we really, um, aspen and birch, gone, totally gone. Uh, I mean, all this northern forest is going to be completely changed um, and, and replaced by oak hickory forest. And we do not want this to happen, okay? Um, this will happen in a world which is very hot, and we don't want that world because it's going to have a lot of other bad impacts. This is not going to be a life-threatening impact, but there will be some um, life-threatening impacts, um, but it'll have a big impact on the forest. Uh, the climate change atlas, I just picked out a couple of species to illustrate if we look at our area, some species like chestnut oak, the darker colors mean more prevalent. Um, so there's some chestnut oaks in, in Maryland. Um, if we keep going on our high emission pathway, there won't be any more chestnut oak in, in Maryland. Even low emissions, if we keep going, it's gonna be higher than where we are now. Um, the chestnut oak is gonna be moving out. But the post oak, which is not very common now in Maryland, will become increasingly common, even under the low emissions pathway. I need to stress, the low emissions pathway is the best we're gonna do now. We're not gonna be able to keep it the way it was. We already missed that. We're not gonna be able to keep it the way it is right now. Even though it's worse than the way it was, it's gonna be hotter even under the most stringent emission control because we already missed a lot of our chance to control emissions. So the low emissions pathway, um, we're gonna have more post oak, but the high emissions, and this is the one that was pictured in the previous slide, post oak is gonna go way up there. So I suspect that that is a part of this takeover of the uh, maple, beech and birch by oaks, that the post oak is really going to be um, increasing. So there's a lot of examples like this in the, in the climate change tree atlas. These are based on models, of course, but the people who do models aren't stupid and um, they calibrate their models. So I, I, would, I, I think this kind of thing, it, projection into the future is quite reliable. Um, okay, 
Um, this is an interesting study that a person at the Chicago Botanical Garden did. And again, this is, it's not because I'm so interested in Chicago, but just because someone actually asked a question and did a study that is important for every area. And that is which species, tree species will survive in Chicago under climate change? Well, you can ask the same question in your yard. What tree species should I plant now if I want you know, my grandchildren to be seeing the tree um, 50 years from now, 75 years from now? You may be your great grandchildren. Um, this person found, uh, studied all the trees that were found in the, in, um, near, near Chicago. So Cook County is where Chicago is located. So they looked at some surrounding counties and uh, light green indicates that the, the tree is present and doing well, okay? Um, and they contrast, this person contrasted the uh, projections, projected future of autumn gold ginkgo and introduced tree with the American linden. Now they're both doing great. Uh, if you look at, uh, well, this is that was before 2020. This was done about 20, I think 2010 or even earlier. So 2020 was a projection uh, in this study. And the projection was that the American linden was gonna be doing worse because it's getting warmer. 2050, much worse. Okay, darker brown means bad. So um, the change is minus about 40% and minus about 80% here. The ginkgo doing okay. Okay, a little bit less, a little bit of a reduction, 11% reduction. Um, so if, if uh, the result of this study suggests that if you were comparing between these two species to plant Chicago and you want the tree to be there in 2080, that you better not pick American linden. He found that 20% of the species in the study, I forget how many were in the study, won't be around in 2050, 20%, and 80% won't be able to survive the conditions in 2080. So 80% of the species that now live in these counties will not be around in 2080 if we continue to allow climate change to proceed. So um, I know a lot of forestry people are working on um, identifying uh, forest trees for um, new plantings of forests um, that will be able to survive in higher temperatures. And so the forestry people are thinking about that. I don't know if there's a lot of, um, of uh, um, um, you know, already knowledge about which varieties are, are good. I just happened to glance over at the chat and saw Allison uh, Milligan um, reminded people um, this is not a reason to plant in the invasive species ginkgo, okay? Um, this is an illustration that actually illustrates two things. We don't have a lot of, um, it illustrates that these two species, one of which is native and one of which is introduced, are going to have very different fates. In fact, 80% of the species are going to have this fate. Um, we, I don't know right now whether the 20% that will be still be around in 2080 are tend to be introduced or not. That is not on this picture and I don't remember it. So um, the point is, I'm not telling you to plant ginkgo trees uh, for uh, climate adaptation. Um, thank you, Allison. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty much the last slide. What can you do at home? Um, well, you can do a lot of stuff at home. Um, I, I know most of, of the people in the audience are already out there planting native herbaceous plants, that is non-woody plants for pollinators, et cetera. Um, but it's very useful to plant as many trees as you can on your property. Um, and uh, um, when you do plant perennial, uh, when you do plant, you know, uh, showy flowered plants um, to emphasize um, perennial and native herbaceous plants, okay? Um, instead of going to Home Depot and buying annuals every year and putting them around. Okay, that's like the most climate unfriendly thing you can do in terms of flowers. Um, it's better to put out those perennials, which I, as a lazy person, adore because, you know, you're, you're just going along through the winter and then without any effort on your part, all of a sudden there's a all these plants <laughs> in bloom and you didn't do anything. So except to just, you know, keep them safe. Um, when you plant trees, this, this picture and this, this uh, suggestion list is from a really good book called The Climate Conscious Gardener, which um, 
it came out of the, I'm looking over here, I think, in fact, I just saw this earlier today. Here it is <laughs> on my bookcase, The Climate Conscious Gardener, and it's from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. This is a great book, really great. It, it is, uh, helps you with um, all aspects of your home landscape. And it's like, I don't know, 12 bucks or something on Amazon. It's from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Um, uh, but this, um, this list of tips is if you are interested in um, storing carbon in the soil of your home landscape. Uh, and um, of course, planting trees um, does a lot of things. It cools your, it co can cool your home. And um, uh, if you plant a, an edible landscape like this with different layers, um, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't are these pears. I don't know what. There's not very many native fruit bearing things, but maybe you could plant pawpaws. They're sort of shrubs, um, and then you can you know plant in different layers like this. This is kind of the permaculture deal, um, but uh, the idea is that you can improve your soil and um, make use of plants' ability to yank carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in soil, and you can do that in your own yard. Um, by planting more trees and following these kinds of guidelines. Um, plant more trees and shrubs where you can choose large um, at, uh, at maturity, large uh, trees and long-lived species that have dense wood. Um, I can tell you from my own experience, don't plant a bunch of tulip poplars. My house is surrounded by tulip poplars and limbs fall down all the time. It's very soft. They grow fast, but they're really terrible. Um, although they are the host plant for some very nice butterflies. Um, uh, grow regionally hardy and, and uh, sort of site appropriate trees. Um, native plants are more adaptable. Avoid high maintenance um, uh, species, plant a diverse mix. So this is just all good stuff that you learn as master gardeners anyway. Um, and um, don't plant little trees too close together because then they can't get big. Um, an important thing to remember with respect to climate change is avoid species or ecotypes that are already at the southern end of their range. That is, you don't find them um, farther south than, say, Maryland. Um, because as it gets warmer, then it's going to be too warm for them. Okay, It's better to choose plants that are found uh, far to the south. Um, it might be a different ecotype of a native plant, but um, at least if the species is found farther south, you're better off than choosing a plant which, you know, um, is only found to the north of us because the whole environment is going to be changing, moving from south to north. Okay, um, this is really another whole topic, but I just wanted to put this in at the end. So um, I'm going to finish off here. We can take some more questions. Um, and as always, if you if something occurs to you, feel free to email me um, anytime. And um, I, I, I've started to get a, just a ridiculous number of emails. And so occasionally I do sort of lose one. If, if you email me and I don't get back to you, just email me again. I don't mind that because um, uh, I, I have, I'm having a hard time with my system of keeping everything organized so that I am responding to, in a timely way to everyone. Okay. Um, I just see it one question while um, uh, Stephanie is organizing questions. I see a question from Fawn Palmer. And in fact, Fawn, you are one of the people who to whom I owe an email. Um, how far south should a southern ecotype be chosen? Um, well, you want to make sure it's going to do well here now. And, um, you know, so you don't want to put um, like uh, the tree that came into mind was Tupelo, but of course, that's found in Louisiana. It's also found in wet conditions, so it's not really a good example. But um, I would just make sure, you know, if you're really going to make a study of it, just make sure there's a little bit of southern, uh, a little bit of buffer to the south. Um, but you want to make sure the plant will do well. You don't want to put palm trees in Maryland at this point, right? Because <laughs> they're not going to do well. Um, Stephanie, other questions? Yes. Um one guest says, I've been seeing monarch caterpillars late in the season in late October, early November, which cannot survive the cold fall temperatures. Assuming these are the migration generation, um, can anything be done to help increase the monarch population? Oh, you mean they're, um, uh, the eggs are being laid too late in the season and the mm -hmm. plants are still around. And so the caterpillars are just is probably maybe another generation of caterpillars added onto the you know what was 
already happening. Um, I'm not uh, very familiar with, with this, but um, I don't really see what you can do. You can't speed up the development of those caterpillars. Um, and if the plant dies before the caterpillars are um, uh, having, uh, you know, made their chrysalis and emerged and flown away, I don't know what you can do about it really. Um, anybody have any uh, yeah. ideas on this? I'm sort of drawing a blank, sorry. Sure, yeah. Uh, I think that makes sense. You know, you can support them as much as you can while they're here and while it is the appropriate season for them, obviously by using native plants and milkweed, but also nectar plants for the adult butterflies. Yeah. But yeah, as far as the cold temperatures, I mean, that's kind of- They're just out of whack. If they're on a, <laughs> if they're on a you know, uh, if they're out there as a second or third instar caterpillar right now, um, I don't know how long it takes them to grow up and get out of here, but you know, they're probably going to freeze before they finish their development. That's because it just, you know, everything's out of whack. You know, the typical right. egg laying period has been extended and now we get caterpillars that are live, you know, too small to yeah. make it through their life cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the next question is, do the wildfires kill the invasive animals? Invasive animals? Invasive animals, like, like what? Not Rodents? Sure. What? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. Perhaps they could be referring to some of the insects that we talked about. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, what? Maybe they could be referring to some of the insect pests that we talked about. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of insects get incinerated in for forest fires. Um, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, many of them will, uh, that normally live near the ground, spiders and, of course, they're not insects. Um, but ground beetles and stuff that live in the litter, it might do okay if the fire you know, goes above them. Um, but anything that's out there on the wood or the leaves is not gonna do well. Um, I don't know. There's just a world of stuff I don't know. <laughs> so you all always ask me really good questions and kind of push, push the levels. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So there's a couple other comments in the chat, but there were no other questions. Um, Oh, no one just came in. And of course we are gonna, we'll make the text from the chat accessible so you guys can have the answers to the questions and also the link. So don't worry about that. Um, let's see. I worry that temperatures are getting warmer but also more variable. Planting more Southern trees may expose them to cold snaps. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, well, uh, the whole issue of warmer springs like really warm weather in February and uh, which causes uh, trees and shrubs and and other and you know herbaceous plants to break dormancy and start to grow and flower um, that is called false spring and that's a really big problem because um, it's okay for those plants to start growing but the um, the uh, things that are causing warming, have not yet eliminated the possibility of late frost. And so, yeah, if you, um, if you bring a tree from too far south up to Maryland um, and it um, uh, would normally be breaking you know, dormancy and flowering early and then even earlier, um, then you're, you are setting it up for being hit by a late frost. So uh, mm -hmm. there, you can't move plants around too fast because it right. just, um, it, it mucks up everything. That's the whole deal with ecosystems is pretty much anything you do messes up something else. And it's very hard to know a, uh, any action that will not be disruptive. Um, right. So I, I did see a comment on the chat about bringing monarchs onto your porch and trying to, you know, sort of encourage them along. Um, and, and then what do you do with them? Where do you release them? When do you release them that doesn't, you know, doesn't interfere with something? I, I don't know. I think when you start moving things around or trying to do manipulations, you can, it, it doesn't always help. I worry. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think Jean put one in from earlier. Um, there's a global effort to increase tree planting. Has any research been done regarding how beneficial this is towards preserving uh, ecosystems. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, it is a good thing to plant trees. However, um, you know, the whole idea that we can plant a trillion trees and 
plant our way out of climate change is a complete fabrication, okay? It's just not enough, it's not gonna happen. And the same thing with storing carbon in the soil through better agricultural practices. Totally a good thing to do, can totally help, but it will not solve the problem. It is not a license to continue business as usual. Mm -hmm. And um, when I read, you know, in the political airwaves about people who want to plant a trillion trees, it's just like, hey, okay, we'll plant a trillion trees. Okay, where are you going to plant these trees? That's the problem. We're going to plant a trillion trees and then everything's going to be okay. We can still, you know, frack gas and do all the other stuff that we're doing. No that doesn't work like that. So I think you have to be a little cautious about claims that are made about planting trees or sequestering carbon, that that will get us out of the climate problem. We need to do a whole array of stuff. Mm -hmm. No one or two things is going to be enough. Absolutely. And if you're interested in that, you can come to one of my En-ROADS workshops. En-ROADS is a climate simulator where you get to say, I want to see how much difference in future climate change it's going to make if I plant a trillion trees, or if I do sequester carbon, or if I put a big tax on frack gas, or you know something else. It's really illuminating. Um, and so, if you have a favorite thing, electric cars, you know how much difference do they make? Um, uh, email me and get on my mailing list, and I'll I'll let you know when I'm giving one of these workshops. Uh, Jean just put the link into the chat box so that everyone has access to it. Jean is on top of it. She always is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The climate simulator is available to everyone. And they're really interested in getting people um, trained to offer workshops in, in this uh, to bring it out to more people. So I did this training over the summer. It's like an eight-week training thing. Um, and I will be offering some of these workshops. So if you're interested, just email me and I'll put you on my list. Um, that's really great. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, that was our last question. And we are um, a little bit over, we're about five minutes over, but um, we did really well. So thank you so much again, Sarah, as always, super informative presentation. I know that everyone really enjoyed it. And as a reminder, we will be posting this recording online.